Who, who else was supposed to be here? Ronnie Marciante from our board. Uh, Marianne. Marianne. Marianne said she was coming. You're, you're uh, She's so aid. Yeah. And uh, of course Scott came. Scott's a candidate from Jim Thorpe. And then Pierce. And Joy said she was coming too. Yeah. Yeah. So. And the two from Panther Valley really wanted to come was Wayne Grisek, their board president, and uh, Bill Mansbury. But out of Panther. Yeah, from Panther. Because they're, they're gonna they're gonna be after more more state money. You know, they Am can't this? there's no sense in raising taxes because they don't get the revenue from them. Yeah. But I wanna I want to thank you all for, for coming that, that did show up. Dave, I don't know if you all know Dave Krause back there. He's oh, we know Dave Krause. Former member of the, the Heighton Bob. Board. Uh, Just Bob. Bob Davis. Oh, Bob Davis. Hi, Dave. Hey. Sure. Dave Krause. Dave Krause. Yeah. Dave serves for Lee Heighton. There, Dave serves for all of, uh, the Heighton on the L-Tri-C Board, which is another one of our mm -hmm. possessions, just like CCTI. Uh, but to uh, to get uh, to kick this off, uh, financial accountability. I guess we could start there. Uh, if if in fact uh, our business managers could care less about fi financial accountability, we're going to run into problems after problems. Uh, because most, what happened at, at Jim Thorpe, I'll tell you, what happened at Jim Thorpe, the, uh, that's kind of what spurred this. The superintendent, yeah, the superintendent knew nothing about uh, running a school district, really. And especially the, the account, or the uh, running the budget. And he would, he, he got under the spell of the, of the business manager, and she just said, you know, do this, do that, it's okay, don't worry about it, and everything. Well, we had like a $20 million fund balance that's whittled down to 12 right now, you know, through our budget's $47 million. The Heightens budget, I think, is 40 Dave? 43, 44. Is it somewhere in there? I know Tamak was only 28. I don't know how they get away with that. Larry Wittig told me it's 28. I said, are you sure? But he, he should know because he's been on that board a long time. But the main thing is... If you want to rubber, come on the board and rubber stamp everything, you're going to run into that problem all the time, no matter what what uh, government uh, position you serve in. If if you depend on somebody else to look at things, you know you're going to run into this problem that we have, and it's not over yet either. We're going through a forensic audit up there, and uh, what's the forensic audit cost you? 14,000 so far. And how long did it take to do it? Well, it's not. We're only halfway there. Okay. So it could be 28,000 till we're done. Till we're done with it. And we had it. Uh, now they're just auditing your entire they budget, are. or your. Uh, they, they are. Not just the, not just the credit card that was issued. Was no, the entire district. They're going through the. They're going through the district. Yes. A every invoice. Yes. Every bill. Yep. Okay. And that, that's a bad. It's a bad thing to have to do now because. That oversight should have been present, you know, at, the, at that time. But that's your board's job. It is. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And, uh, the, and the board itself, some of these people were spending money that, let's use the term, not the most ethical right. uses or consumption of funds. Right. So um, whether they were legal or not is a different term. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. And when they were using them, less than common sense would say is ethical. Um, the other board members didn't even know that it was occurring. That, that, that's true. So and therefore, the business not, manager should have been blowing the whistle. Well, they were the one. The business yeah. manager was the one that was... She, she, was, com she was complicit. In, in, Ringmaster. Yeah, she, she was... Yeah, don't worry about anything because her position always is is just raise the taxes. You know, not cut expenses, raise taxes. That's always been her position. 
And, uh, Jerry, can I ask you, did the business manager in the Jim Thorpe Area School District have the skills, background, experience, education to manage that size of budget? She did not in the beginning, no. She was, she was on the job training. She was, yeah, unfortunately that's what was happening. Mm -hmm. But I was, I was the only one early on char uh, checking with what, what was going on. Everybody else was on the board was just rubber stamping everything, the people that were on the board. And the problem, the problem there is, just like I became the, I became the culprit for questioning things, you know, because we had this big fund balance, you know. But and to answer your question, so, so the real answer is, who hires the business manager and who do they work for under mm -hmm. whose authority? Mm -hmm. And it's the school board. It's higher and fire but, authority. But her immediate supervisor, the business manager's immediate supervisor is the superintendent. You know, so he's given her, he don't know why he's doing it, but he's given her sterling evaluations, you know, and he don't know why, but he, he did that because his, his job, his job he thought was to be uh, an emperor. He was trying to create an empire for himself, you know. It's unfortunate because he didn't have any he didn't have any background to be the uh, superintendent. Right. So this is statewide. Mm -hmm. So what's happening statewide is we recognize this management lack of leadership issue, mm -hmm. right? Or a district leadership. It does two things. It, it takes away the trust of the people that you hired these you elected mm -hmm. these people to serve the people, and then provide this oversight. And it becomes very evident in the um, uh, auditor's report in Scranton. Mm -hmm. And they, they just got underneath a financial recovery plan, mm -hmm. which they just published. Mm -hmm. And in that report, um, and we can learn from these reports to be able to better manage our districts. Mm -hmm. right? But uh, if I go back to the auditor general <coughs> report in reference to the Scranton financial recovery, which stated they had six issues, including indictments right, for financial crimes, and a former district manager has pled guilty, right, to felony corruption charges. Right underneath the, inside the district, right? And the auditor stated in number six of this summary that there is a demonstrable lack of public trust in the district leadership. <laughs> so, it's obvious that, that the electorate has to take the responsibility to put people in office that can oversee their government, mm -hmm. that can oversee the process. And as soon as that government becomes complicit, and I'll use the term, as soon as you find yourself having cake for the birthday of the superintendent, mm -hmm. you're probably not going to have the same oversight responsibility that you should. doesn't mean you shouldn't be nice to the person. Doesn't mean you should be respectful to the person. He has a job to do. But the ultimate responsibility is to provide oversight to that district governance. And that's your job. So, so Mr. Bradley, then, how do term limits uh, tie into this? There are. So you never reach the point of getting the cake for the superintendent or vice versa? You can. How long have you been a board member? <laughs> 23 years now. So my question there is, is, there is, is that choice. a good thing? It, it can be. But I believe in term limits, and I believe in, uh, that's where we, we disagree, Sure. but uh, I believe in term limits. I believe that you should go in once and done, do your service to the government, mm -hmm. and then get out and take the experience that you have, put it in the audience, so that everybody gets a chance in that seat. Mm -hmm. So after 23 years is what, six terms? Yep. You'd have six guys as smart as Jerry in, right. the, in the audience saying, wait, I was in that seat, I know how this works, mm -hmm. and then I can keep an eye on it. And by doing that, you're going to build, if you do that times nine, you're going to build a community that understands the responsibility right. of the district, and, and you're going to have a building that understands the responsibility as a community mm -hmm. to fund the schools, to provide mm -hmm. what they need. But if they also recognize that when you're missing financial records, no one's holding the thumb to the fire. Yeah. Right? How can you go to the guy you just had cake with and say, hey, by the way, where's that report I'm looking for? You mentioned a, a business manager and the hiring and the skill set sure. of a business manager. Is anyone in this room could say that if you ran a company that you would want to hire an individual for that job? 
There's two things to the advantage of the hirer of the hiree. The first thing is you get to meet nine people within the industry or 10 people within the industry that have industry knowledge, that maybe have some skills and benefits, and they're gonna tell you what they wanna do when they get here. So you got nine interviews of people that you get to tap their brain and their vision and their passion and their foresight to understand where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. And then after you visit with those nine or 10 or whatever it is, you can then pick two that you have a real more in-depth interview. And you say, okay, now you're the people that we're looking at. We're looking at these last couple. Number six mentioned this. What do you think about that? Number four mentioned this. What do you think about that? Right? Number two is in, pick, pick an area, pick, in, in coming back from um, Schenectady, New York. She might not want to, or he might not want to take this job. But he had a couple really good ideas. You're our primary candidate. What do you think about this guy's ideas? And then you can weed out those last two. In our district, we just hired a business manager. Several people applied. Applications were taken. They were collected by our district administration. Guess how many our board was able to see? We're able to or decided to actually see? No, we're able to see. Asked, requested, and were provided. What do you think, Dave? Probably two. Scott, how many of this? Probably one. <laughs> You're getting close. Two. Huh. And when you asked for the other ones, they were restricted. The information was hidden from the board. Now, they're the persons responsible for the hiring of the firm. And to accept, if the, if the superintendent's holding those documents, that the nine board members, to accept the idea that we're not going to allow some of our board or all of our board to see that and not hold that person accountable to make sure that the person hiring gets to see the applicants. Well, now you have a management issue. Mm -hmm. Now you have a abdication of authority, right? You're going to let someone else make the decision that you're responsible for making. You're going to have a rubber stamp situation where you're going to take the two that they gave you and choose from them, which really is rubber stamping the, the exclusion of the other set and, and any business anywhere there's not many people in this world that would think that that's a good process in which to hire a government entity usually in, in the world of government you think civil service exam you think hit these marks have these skills have these capabilities and therefore qualifications are met and then from there you have an emotional intelligence review. You have other other uh, determining factors that may separate someone from another. And if the board would hire uh, another perfect example is, is again in an auditor's report where they talk about the hiring practice. If the hiring practice is transparent, it saves tons of money. Mm -hmm. So what you're looking at is if they had a hiring process and say, look, we're going to give like a civil service exam, we're going to give certain points for people that are local. You want somebody local within yeah, your school for So hey, if you happen to own property and live locally, you get a couple more points on this test. Mm -hmm. A couple more, you know, you have a higher opportunity mm -hmm. to hire. You have to do it legally, has to do it within the fair and, and uh, uh, practice of hiring. But you should be able to rate these people. And the, and the real people hiring them is the district stakeholders. So prior to hiring, the transparency in hiring which again, the Auditor General highly recommends, reduces the concerns about this public trust and district leadership. By having it transparently hired, the stakeholders can meet these people. They can add their comments. And then it's the responsibility of the board member to collect all that data and make an informed decision for the best interest of the stakeholders, the community, and the many uh, people that they were elected to oversee. That's where you're looking at. I'll, I'll mention another one real quick in, um, in the Fairfield, right? So we know we can do better if we just focus on the work of office because we know power corrupts. Mm -hmm. And that's where this term one is. If I get people out, they don't have that stickiness mm -hmm. to the seat. So any chance you get to remove an incumbent, it's just intrinsically more valuable to the community to get rid of that incumbent. Sorry, Jerry. Like, that's no problem. <laughs> but it's the truth. 
And as, I, as a friend, I, I was, it's I was the truth for, and, and do it, right? I, I was for term, term, term limits. limits. All along, I, I, I would hope that the uh, that school directors, instead of elected every two years, are elected every year, you know, to have a, a more smooth changeover, put it that way. Like in Jim Thorpe, I think you, and uh, the Heighton people, what do you have? Five or seven seats up? Five. Five? Yeah. yeah five, we four, have, every, we, have, we have five. Well, sometimes it gets a little more when people resign, too, you know. They have to fill those two. Or, or intimidated. Intimidated. Or pushed or out. Pushed out, whatever. I, I've seen a lot of that in our district. And when you watch that turnover of board members that are volunteer positions mm -hmm. that are being intimidated, threatened, and pushed out, you got an issue. But let's go back to this uh, Fairfield report on the Auditor General side. In his report, he said, I quote, the complete disregard for transparency is appalling. Okay. And then he wrote, at any time I see a school district spending more on legal fees, it raises the alarms because I want every available dollar going towards the classroom education. Wise man makes sense, Auditor General. Right? In the report, it stated that the heightened public scrutiny surrounding the board's decision, I'm sorry, the heightened scrutiny surrounding the board's decision-making process and the lack of transparency led to an increased number of right-to-know law requests from the public. So the district changed its right-to-know law procedures to have all requests go through the district solicitor. Yeah. Right? They put an extra block to the transparency because when scrutiny occurred, they didn't take the humble seat and say, I will show you what we're doing and why. They went the other way. They blocked transparency, right? So I know our, our the Heighton District has every right to know requests go through the solicitor. Same thing. Just, it raises our cost. They go through the roof. Even after a right to know request is granted by the state office of uh, open records, our district will actually spend additional money to appeal that decision in the court of common pleas, right? So back to the report. Legal costs incurred. To have the solicitor review all the right to know requests cost the district an additional $21,000 in legal fees, which is equal to 26% of the total legal costs for the 2014-2015 school year. These fees have been uh, these fees may have been avoided if the board decision making process and dealings had been more open and transparent to the public. So here's a guy, Auditor General of the entire state of Pennsylvania, that gets to peer into all of these school districts. And in my short term as a tenure and my travels, I visited many school districts, I'm going to say over 20, and met with different board members at these districts. And I asked them the same question. They don't know. They're clueless. They just don't know. I think it's a function of how the system is working currently. They're not educated properly to be able to do their job provide that oversight. They, are, they tend to be more of a dignitary-based position and not recognizing the weight of their authority. So they abdicate the authority to the professionals. And we have that problem here in the I'm going to abdicate my authority. I'm no lawyer. I'm going to abdicate it to this guy. I'm no, you know, I'm no educator. I'm going to abdicate it to this guy. I'm, I'm going to trust my people. And the difference that they miss, and when we bring it up across the state, when I mention the idea of trust but verify. That one idea of verifying their trust has created so much of a benefit for the state of Pennsylvania in these audit reports. We have found things that are illegal use of funds. We have found things that are illegal use of meetings, sunshine acts, mm -hmm. people violating the, the 710 of public participation and not letting people have the right to speak. Yeah. We've watched this, and the cost to defend it, the pride gets in the way. They will spend money on immunity, not just say, I'm sorry, I didn't know the rule was like that. Now that you educated me, that's a good thing. And the solicitors and the school districts, it's an ATM machine. Mm -hmm. If you start a fight, lawyers get paid. We found that there is a extensive amount of children with special needs 
that have a hired a lawyer to get the entitlement benefits out of a district. They're entitled to them, mm -hmm. but to get them, they have to hire an advocate, a, a third party. It's, a, it's an attorney. And then that attorney sends notice to the school district, and then we have to hire our attorney to make sure that we're properly using the taxpayers' funds, right? We want to make sure they're correct. But in our district, I asked the question, how much is the benefits that we're quibbling over, and how much is the attorney fees going to be? Prior to making that decision of whether you're going to fight the benefit. Because, heaven forbid, you use an over-benefit for a child, right? But at the same time, you want to do what's right. And I found out that not only does the state have a program called the Office of Dispute Resolution, which will do that for free, and they'll say, you know what? I looked at your IEP, our professionals checked it out. We, as the state of Pennsylvania, that have looked at these things all the time, will have a due process hearing, and we'll decide what, what needs to happen, and then you as a district will do it, right? It's like, go into the authority, go into mom, right? Mother's Day, we're going to mom. You're gonna ask the right? No, nobody can answer, you gotta ask mom. Mom's the one that's gonna So the Office of Dispute Resolution is the end authority to this process. Our district spent $9,000 on one lawyer, the student's lawyer, and we spent $9,000 on our lawyer to, to quibble over a couple thousand dollars worth of an item. Sir. Please clarify for me, if you will, Mr. Bradley, you mentioned, you used the term over-benefit. I want to make sure. Okay, so Is it benefit? worth the over-benefit or not worth? So, because again, let me give you some context. Because I have a special needs daughter who's 19. Great. Right, and she is in the intermediate unit. As a matter of fact, she attends Lee Height High School. So I'm trying to understand a little bit more clearly. So let's let's go down this path. Yeah, it's simple. Let's pretend that uh, I'll, I'll I'll go completely on one side so that there's no discussion about an individual child or anything. Right. Yeah. We're just going to pick a blind child. Yeah. Right. And the benefit by the by the state. Entitlement would say Braille book, Braille teacher, mm -hmm. because not audio book, it's cheaper, right? right. It's, yeah. it's Braille book and Braille teacher because you want the child to learn how to read mm -hmm. so that they can decide what they want to read when they grab, mm -hmm. right? What they yeah. want to do. It's their passion that you're mm -hmm. aiming for, right? So if the state requirement is Braille book and Braille teacher, mm -hmm. and let's say it's these five Braille books, right? and the person has an IEP, and they say, look, I think I get these seven books, right? Mm -hmm. And the extra two books cost a couple thousand, right? Mm -hmm. At which point, the, the bureaucracy of the entitlement program can legitimately say, no, mm -hmm. you're only authorized to have these five Braille books. Mm -hmm. But if they're gonna say audiobook, or you know, maybe they say, hey, we'll give you these five, and these two will be audiobooks, or they're 12 bucks instead of 20 bucks, or 100 bucks. Mm -hmm. That's a negotiation, and that can take place within a district. Mm -hmm. And that's what our that's what our people do. Mm -hmm. Our district does a great job of this. Mm -hmm. They do a fantastic job. But as soon as they run into this problem, they churn the machine. And it starts costing money. It costs a fortune. More money than And it only costs you. to the solicitors sure. and the lawyers, right? Mm -hmm. And when we're brought into a meeting to have this discussion, and you find out whether or not the economical decision-making process, right, the same auditor general concept of the decision-making process, mm -hmm. that's what's missing. So we have found that many students don't even know that they should have an IEP, right? And, and ultimately, if every child is independent and if every child is an individual, mm -hmm. they should all have their own individual education program dictated by the student and the parents and the Department of Education, which says, I'm going to give you this educational benefit. Mm -hmm. Think of the educational benefit as a dollar value, rather than just this book, this teacher, these walls, those lights, mm -hmm. this thing. Because when you homeschool a kid, or you charter school a kid, or you run to BHA, or whatever you're going to do to move them through this process to meet the requirements, they should be making that choice. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you turn it into a dollar value, like our district's about $16,000 a child per year. So over a 12 year uh, or 13 year educational cycle, about 186, just under $200,000. Mm -hmm. 
if I told the parents up front, you're going to have $200,000, dollars you got to get your kid from goal A to goal B, right? And these are the, these are the hurdles they got to go over. These are the hoops they got to jump through. And now let's, let's see what we can do to help your child. And one of the best things you can normally do to a child to motivate them is let them have a choice, right? So if you ask your, your child, uh, what do you want to do this weekend? And as soon as they say their first item and you ask the question, what's your second choice? What's your third choice? And they might not get their first choice, they might not get their second choice, they might get their third choice. But if they can pick their classes the way colleges pick their classes, knowing they have to meet all of them sometime, the value would be to the district. The savings would be to the district. You'd have a motivated student, you'd have a motivated teacher. This kid wants to be in my class. I was a teacher, I know how this is. This kid wants to be in my class. He chose it. He felt he has some buy-in to it. And the student feels that he wants to be in that class. And there's nothing wrong with that process because we have very educated teachers and they can, uh, we can organize that across the board. But um, under the uh, Susquehanna report, so we're back on that a little bit for a second, the, uh, on the Susquehanna report, uh, the Auditor General says that the board was willingness to rubber stamp the solicitor cost the district tons of money. And here I quote, right? However, the decision was made to follow the district solicitor's advice rather than the advice provided by the Peasers. And later stated in the report, referring to the contract services, which is the district's responsible for hiring all the contractors, right? Uh, Subcontract, whether it's grass cutting or, or extra teaching services, uh, um, uh, psychological evaluations, whatever. They're, they're all subcontracts. They recommended actively monitoring those service providers. And then in his audit, he wrote, our audit of the Susquehanna Township District found multiple examples of the district's failure to properly contract the services, as well as poor oversight over the individuals and companies with whom the district had a contract. It goes back to this oversight. If you don't have the information, you can't provide oversight. Mm -hmm. And that's the key. The elected board system primarily as, is a directive to provide oversight to the district government and their activities. So um, if we hold the public government educational entitlement program accountable to the public funding and the public school system, it's the people that then have that responsibility and you just gotta give them access. One of the things I wanted to show is this. Here's my answer. And I've, I've been sharing this across the state, right? As a board of director, I found a, a, a case out in Western Pennsylvania. Our district fought this for quite a while, financially, but we finally got it through. But there was a case where a guy had to go to court. I think this through. He's a director and he wanted to see the solicitor's bills. And they told him no. And in school code, it's his responsibility to pay those bills, right? We all have to pay the bills. They should be separated out and seen. So he had to go to court. He won in court. And after he won in court, I brought it to our district here in Lehigh and said, look, you have to show me the bills before we pay for them. You have to let us review them. You have to let us see and weed through first class airfares, then there's a Dominales. We have to decide not only what compartment it goes in, which is what a normal audit does. Here, here's, you bought tires for your bus. The auditor's responsibility, that goes in transportation, right? Our job is to decide whether or not we needed those tires. And if you look up in Scranton, millions of dollars were spent on their transportation. They're going to force every district to start bidding this stuff out because they saw how slippery of a slope it was. So what we did was we now insist by using the law that the district provides me, a board of director, with all of the bills prior to our approval. Since it's America, and I love America, I just love it. I bring my camera, and a, a buddy of mine that has, is very good with this skills set me all up with this idea that I can scan using the camera, the Canon camera is my scanner. So I am now scanning those images, about a thousand of them. And usually it takes a little more than, less a little more than an hour. And I can have a physical copy of every image. They turn into pictures. And then they can be batch cropped. 
focus put in and released online. And I can have not one auditor that's worried about what pocket it goes in, but I can hire for free thousands of auditors within the district that care about how their money is spent. And that's what we're looking for. And if we can promote this to the point where your $15,000 forensic audit buys a digital scanner, which most of these schools already have, but just give them the responsibility to run everything through the scanner and publish it on the district website, prior to asking, prior to even having to go through the right to know process, prior to having any discussion, prior to having any interaction with any attorney, because these bills are open to the public, and we proved it. So once we did that, we can now release to the public what's going on with their money. And we found all sorts of things here and there that, that are taking place. And it's not only the ability to find the problem, because let's face it, everybody makes a mistake. The real goal here is to prove to the world that we have oversight. Mm -hmm. And once you have that, people will tend to have a different decision-making process. When you put cameras on a corner to check people for whether or not they go through the red light or whether they go through the stop sign, whereas it's an intrusion, people do it less, whether a police officer's there or not. So if we can use that system instead of the government against us to maintain personal privacy, but governmental transparency, and that's the difference, accountability through governmental transparency, but maintain personal privacy. We I can make sure that they have to do that process. I think you hit a great point. And you know, I have a military background. So from a logistician perspective from the US Army, we like to have a push system versus a pull, right? We anticipate the needs of the troops in the field. We don't wait for them to ask. And that's how information should flow from county government, from school boards, school districts, right? We're pushing the information out. They're making it available. So we have much more, let me say, many less right to knows and much more I already know because the information is provided for the citizen and you have a thousand auditors instead of one because you're basically using the concept of crowdsourcing right for individuals to come together and take responsibility for helping manage their resources that are being used in whatever government entity is using those resources and it's theirs yeah, it's there. It's exactly. So, so take responsibility for it. Make Just like your own checkbook. Make them right? responsible. Yeah. We're actually holding the stakeholders responsible. Yeah. And right in school code, under policy zero one one, it's our responsibility to seek the input of a of a stakeholder. Mm -hmm. We have to seek it, not ask whether or not they want to care. So this is saying, look at this. We want your input. We're seeking. Mm -hmm. We're doing our job as a board of directors. We also have that same process in an open meeting. Under open meeting law, the responsibility of the district is to provide a reasonable opportunity prior to taking away a restriction. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use your funds. So before we make this vote on these funds, you have to have an opportunity to speak. Before I make this new law, you need an opportunity to speak. So before I restrict your privacy, privileges, and freedoms as government, you have to have your opportunity for input. In a district, they usually have an opportunity before the agenda to say, Any, here's all the things we're going to do. Here's all the ways we're going to restrict your freedoms. We're going to take your money. We're going to use it in these ways. We're going to make these new laws. We're going to hire these new people. We're going to do these things on this agenda, this meeting today. And anybody that wants to speak about them before we take away your freedoms, Here's your opportunity to speak. And that's the standard uh, with the uh, uh, Sunshine Act. Give me a second here. Yeah. So the, the, the standard is to shall provide. Mm -hmm. You have to provide it to them prior to making the unofficial action. Mm -hmm. So if I change this agenda, if I add something to it, prior to it, mm -hmm. you shall provide. Not say, and you just had your hand raised, and I appreciate that. Not say they don't have their hand raised, right? It's I'm going to give it to you now before you even ask for it. It's the it's like you said. It's going to be the push around the pull, mm -hmm. and that's the violations that our district had done mm -hmm. for decades. Mm -hmm. And it's as if they didn't even know what the law was, as if they never even read it. Mm -hmm. And the problem with <laughs> incumbents mm -hmm. is you're hurting their pride to bring it up. 
They get defensive. They, they won't even read it. They'll go to court over it. They will ask for immunity from not knowing something mm -hmm. because you've hurt their pride. Just because you said, look, I read this law, and here's what it says, and you've got to do that. It's our job. And you check with the state, and they say, yeah, you got to do that. That's the job. Mm -hmm. And you check with the judge, and it's just, yeah, that's how the thing works. Mm -hmm. And then when they don't want to do it, but there's an issue there because these are volunteers. You've got to have some compassion for them. They're good people. They have good ideas, but then they get stuck in a rut of authority. And it's a shame because it's that arrogance that takes away this opportunity mm -hmm. for helping our kids. You know, it, it's that's the whole thing. That these kids should be helped to get from kindergarten to graduation as fast as possible, as motivated as they can be, so they can go on with their lives and do whatever else they want to do. Because we've given them the foundation. It's a gift from the community to the individual child. Regardless of how many children you have, you get this gift. It's a public funded school system. So if you have six children, we give this gift to all six. If you have four or three or one or none, you choose not to get the gift. And that's where this problem comes in because they have this consternation constantly between the two parties. And instead it should just be an open-minded, follow the law, best practices, transparency, due process, and this idea to de make a demonstrate public trust mm -hmm. through transparency. But Mr. Bradley, I want more than a right to speak. I want more than a right to speak. I want the right to have a conversation with my elected representative. So I don't want to go to a public comment period and simply be able to talk. So I want to be able to hear something other than no comment. I want to hear what is the reasoning, the judgment, the rationale behind their decision making, or even to put a resolution or a proclamation onto the agenda for a conversation. And I, yeah, I don't well, see that. Yeah. I don't see that occurring. At least, again, understand. I focus at, at county government. Uh, it's everywhere. Yeah. I can explain it. I want to see what Jerry thinks. Yeah. Well, obviously, I want I want that conversation to transpire. At all board meeting, at all mm -hmm. board meetings, in the public comment, or mm -hmm. even if something changes a little bit in the agenda, we have to discuss it right away sure. and give the public the opportunity to discuss. You know, and that's that's where you'll get the input. That's where you get people to come to the meetings. If you stonewall them, they're not coming. Right. Which is way to launch it. Hold on. So I yeah. get this. This is exactly right. So if they get stonewalled. They don't attend because no one's going to stand on the corner and argue with a brick wall. Right. It's by design that they don't respond. Mm -hmm. I looked. There's nothing in Pennsylvania school code that prohibits the interaction between a board member and a public speaker. I checked within our school policy. There is nothing. The only thing it says is they don't have to. It doesn't say they're not allowed to. There's a difference. Right? right? Are you Army or Navy? Oh, okay, so the difference between an Air Force pilot and a, and, a Na and a Navy pilot, right? Air Force pilot says it's not in the book, therefore I can't do it. Navy pilot says, hey, it's not in the book. <laughs> they have that same process, and they're trained this way. Chris, I apologize, but I went to the training and they were told these things. Mm -hmm. This is wrong. This is from top down. They were trained improperly by an association. And instead, they should read the laws themselves. They should recognize their public servants, and they should do their job. And that job is if a guy stands up at that podium for his three minutes of comments to the meeting and says, hey, I think we got a problem at this bus stop, right? We got kids in, that, that uh, uh, are at risk here. The answer should be, thank you for bringing it to the attention. I'd like to put that on the agenda for this month or next month or whenever, and let's, let's have that conversation. Are you prepared today to make a presentation for us? Mm -hmm. Great, we have new business at the end of the meeting. Stick around, we're gonna get that, we're gonna get to it. Mm -hmm. Or can we put it on your comment next time? But that conversation should take place right then and there. Not, thank you very much, have a nice day. Right. Next person with their three minutes. Right. Which is yeah. which is insanity yeah. because you know that you're blocking that person from becoming one of your helpers for free. Mm -hmm. I mean that person is looking after those kids, that person's looking after that bus stop. That person is looking after their community school. 
and we want to encourage that. That's why policy 011, I think it's letter D, says engaging stakeholder input. Not silencing them. And, and Chris, I apologize, I don't know if you know, but in our past district, in our past year, not only did we struggle with this idea of letting people speak prior to a new motion, yeah. I mean, there's recordings on, online that just, you want to pull your hair out. So I got some left, and apparently right, you yeah. did more than I did, right? right. But it's, it's videotaped. They, they know they're violating the law. The question is, can you enforce it? Right. And then the next part of it is, why wouldn't they want to? Mm -hmm. right. But it's by design. We had the idea that you do have the authority, right? I can slam my gavel, call in the police, and say, he's being disruptive and remove them from the meeting. Now, the question becomes, is that legally allowed? And the reality is, no, right? Even if they're disruptive, the police are supposed to maintain the peace, have a conversation. If they have to put that person, like th treat it like it's a court of law because basically you're in a meeting, right? If they got a gag and tie that person to the chair <laughs> before they remove him from the meeting, that should be the process. Now, I'm a little bit uh, uh, overboard with that, but that's kind of the concept, not this issue. And that's why many of these meetings are devoid of interaction, which is a shame because it's free information. Just like you would when you're hiring somebody, getting the opportunity to interview them, you get to interview 7,000 or 8,000 public constituents and ask them what they're thinking. But you've got to draw it out of them because they've been silenced so long that you ask them, you know, uh, what was your what's your tagline? If uh, oh, uh, uh, if you find yourself saying there's no use trying because they don't they're, 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 right. <laughs> no use it's, no, it's, no use complaining. It's not like anyone's gonna listen. Yes. Well, guess what? You've elected a board. It's their responsibility, their obligation, their oath of office tells them that they have to listen. The Sunshine Act demands it, the meeting law demands it. They're required to. Listen, they're required to have their email address available to the public. They're required to be able to call the district and say, I want to talk to my director, even if they don't know who they are, because I got a problem. They should have a complaint process, which is required by law to have. I asked, how many complaints do you think the Arden School District had last year? 2,000 kids. Zero. How many compla formal complaints that made it to the board to be adjudicated by the board? Because the board at a, at a school district is the three branches of government. They write the laws, they hire an enforcement of the laws through the administration, and they adjudicate the law. So how many do you think they adjudicate? How many complaints got to the level of adjudication? Zero. The question then has to be, that's a statistical anomaly. As a businessman, when you find an opportunity with a statistical anomaly, it should pique your interest. And if it piques your interest, you should say, wait a second, this is kind of strange. Why don't we take a look at why? Same thing. Can I give you an example of a statistical anomaly, right? Something that, and I, I was fortunate, I actually took a course in probability at LTRIC. It was a prerequisite for, for my MBA, something I didn't take in my <laughs> earlier studies. So I started attending commissioner meetings in August of 2016, and my job gives me a lot of flexibility to attend a lot of them, actually more than any other private citizen in Carbon County during that same period bar none. I often found myself the only individual plus private citizen with three media reps sitting there. But there's been over 145 meetings of simply the Board of Commissioners. That doesn't include the embedded election board, salary board, retirement board, or also the prison board, which the commissioners also sit in. Right? So in those 145 meetings, it averages about 25 votes a meeting, more or less. Right? Yeah. Some of them are easy, right? Eagle Scout proclamation, you know, look at some of the checks, yeah, that's all good. But now, so there's three opportunities uh, 
or there's three possible answers or positions a commissioner can take. For, against, abstain, and recuse themselves. During that time, not once have I ever heard a no vote by any commissioner. And I went back through most of the minutes, and, you know, again, the approved minutes, and could not find a no vote. So there's an opportunity for 10,875 chances for one no vote. Yet these three commissioners have agreed on every single resolution. You couldn't take that to the track. Right. right. You have a better chance of right winning the lotto. In our district, in our district, same, same thing. And yeah. I just I found out that there is five rubber stamping board members mm -hmm. right now that have never discussed these agenda items to the level of making a decision and a, a confined decision to the point where you had the data in front of the people to make that decision. Mm -hmm. And then had a discussion, and we have a we have a constant five to four, mm. because that discussion doesn't always take place. Now there's a certain amount of votes; they're just automatically you're going to get everyone agrees. Sure, you got to pay the bills. You got to yeah. do something. Yeah. We understand, mm -hmm. but States. the blind trust that takes place, the the eject the citizens so they don't find out how we're making these decisions. The sunshine act. The sunshine act. Yes. Rubber stamping the solicitor, the people you're elected to oversee, missing financial records. I mean, can you even imagine when you went to those meetings, they had an agenda. The pertinent documents that go to that agenda are required by law mm -hmm. to be handed to the citizens to which they represent. Mm -hmm. This is not private information. Mm -hmm. This is public information. There's no special information that a board member mm -hmm. gets, right? It's public pertinent documents. So in those meetings, were you given that information? No, absolutely not. But we never had law, the background. And I couldn't question, well, what is the background information? The public comment period had already transpired. It's required by law that that information is published and put in the public's hands at the meeting. Mm -hmm. That pertinent document of anything like that. Why am I going to restrict your freedom, take your money, mm -hmm. make a new law, make a new tax, make a new whatever, without letting you see what we're doing? And the fact that that pertinent document, whatever document that I as a elected official would be allowed to use to make that decision, public information. As soon as it becomes part of that agenda, public information. And here's the worst part about our district and other ones across the state, like we said, and it's all part of this district leadership. If I want to make a decision on, you know, let's, let's pay off the mortgage or a bond that we're paying a high interest debt with some of our cash that we're making no interest on. Pretty solid financial decision. Mm -hmm. Pretty straightforward financial decision. And if you want to question why or how to do it, you should have certain documents. You should be able to say, well, how many more months is that? Mm -hmm. Do we have a penalty for paying off our own? What do we make on this interest? Now, when we, once we saw this number, by the way, we quickly moved all our money to a better bank. <laughs> almost four times more mm -hmm. interest because no one ever looked. They didn't take the time. They just rubber stamped it, right? But that decision to collect that data, any board member should be able to go to a meeting and say, look, for me to make this decision, I would want this information. And prior to doing that, that information should be defined by the board of nine and then approved by the board of nine as it is pertinent. If I want to if I'm doing a bond document and a, and a financial uh, uh, savings money, and I want to find out what you had for dinner last night, that's a different story. But if it's pertinent to these decisions, that information should be collected, regardless of whether one person asked for it or nine people asked for it. Because if you had a good idea and think, hey, maybe I should look at this, it should be agreed upon. He's an intelligent man, elected by the people, and if he has an interest, Maybe he's going to find something. Maybe he has a different insight. And that's why I have nine individual board members. That's where this block voting, rubber stamping, we have to support our administration. Mm -hmm. We have to just, you know, they're the public official. They're, the, uh, they're the professionals. He's the solicitor. He, he knows. He, I can't read, read English in a law, right? It's, he's the solicitor. He's mm -hmm. the guy. Trust, but verify. Mm -hmm. Get a second opinion.
And like you said, you should be able to have that discussion mm -hmm. so that you can have that second opinion. And you're the second opinion in those meetings because you're the ones that showed up. That's pretty much all I had. Go ahead, Byron. I was just going to say, and once those issues are solved, you have more people that will want to come on the board and take a role. Mm -hmm. And, and also show up to the meeting. <laughs> Let's face it, if you're going to get answered, I might show up, I got an idea, right? I, and here's the weird part. This is where this government entity that's spending, let's make sure we get this straight, 40 plus million dollars every year to educate 2,000 kids. Right? Like Clockwork, immunity, rubber stampers, abdicating authority, blindly trusting. And as soon as somebody wakes up, shows up, and says, wait a second, prior to making that decision, I get a chance to comment. I get a chance to ask for information. Wait a second. You got your agenda. I want to see all the pertinent documents. I want to see what you're seeing prior to you making your decision. Because you work for me. I want to see what's going on. You're, I'm a citizen. You're an elected official. You work for me. I want to see what you see. All hell breaks loose. Remove from meetings, please. Literally, they eject citizens, right? Rebuked. Right? Slapped, threatened with lawsuits. Publicly censured. They attack the individual that's using his rights to try to fix this $40 million consumption every year. So the question becomes, what's being hidden? And we're learning more about what happened at Jim Thorpe. And I'm sure there's a lot of things when you read Fairfield, it's Susquehanna, it's Granton. I mean, felony charges. Mm -hmm. How does nobody see it first? How did nobody in the community know? You're telling me that this, these people were doing these felony charges and no one in that district knew what they were doing? Look at the county commissioners. Clark you, got things, you got things going on there? You're telling me no one there knew what was happening? You or know, were they turning a blind eye, blind trust, rubber stamping what's going on? In, in Carbon County, several times, I, I missed you just by a little bit. And uh, I was in there doing what you were doing. And uh, all of a sudden, a meet, the meeting place would be changed. You go to a meeting and they had moved the meeting to discuss things so they wouldn't have accountability. Or, well, you know, another problem there is when did they give you agenda for a Carbon County Commissioner's meeting? Oh, about two to three minutes prior to the meeting of starting. So you never have the opportunity fix that. to prepare for that public comment period. So well, in my short tenure, not only did we publish the agenda on Thursday online, yeah. We published the pertinent documents online, yeah. which is just amazing. I just love that. That's such a great thing. Mm -hmm. And then we we had the uh, district live stream the meeting. They're horrible at it. Right? It's always act of, they got to learn how to do it. But right. they live stream, yeah. and there, those values. Are yeah. Jerry, how's that in Jim Thorpe in reference to an agenda publication? The agenda. <clears throat> the agenda. How soon prior to the meeting? How much prior? If we to have the meeting a Monday well? meeting. We always say the agenda must be out Mac minimum by Friday prior to. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Friday prior to. Mm -hmm. And uh, that became lax mm -hmm. along the way, too. It, just like Dave said, you show up at the meeting and there's the agenda in right. front of you. Yeah. Yeah. We got it we got we, the Thursday. We, it, should be, it should be published throughout the month. Yeah. It should be an ongoing document, a live document. Yeah, living, breathing think, document. Yeah. Right, there's That's always the going to be some changes that take place. But yeah. get us a 90, 95% solution. So should be there by the 15th. If, you have the, if your meeting's at the end of the month, by the 15th of the month, the agenda's yeah. already being created. It should already be published. And the access to that agenda should be available to the public. Yeah. And they don't have access. The only people that write our agenda, superintendent, president of a board. So a board member can't add things to an agenda without going through this whole other process called the director's concern. All right. And we're getting that, we're getting that fixed at Jim Thorpe, you know, over the last two years, little by little, by getting directors on that are concerned 
about rubber stamping. That, that, that has been the problem. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I don't like the, it, and, and we tried it through the courts. It, it's painful to go through the courts and try to get accountability within a government and, and transparency within your government. Mm -hmm. It's got to be done in the election. It's cheaper, mm -hmm. it's easier, and it's 100% it's effective with no rates of appeal, no rates of immunity, mm -hmm. right? Kick them to the curb. Mm -hmm. And once they're kicked to the curb, the option of getting back in is very slim. Mm -hmm. Because people already recognize that governance is a, is a character-driven responsibility. Mm -hmm. And when you get the right character, right? Boy, I'm a character. But if you get the right character, you uh, um, can effectively govern a, a, a community. How long should an average meeting last? As long as it takes. Long as it takes. Several hours. I mean, if you're going to allow people to speak, allow people to have comment, allow people to be part of their government, yes. But the reality is, the effective part of the meeting where you're voting on things should be very small because most things don't have the data or information to make an educated decision. I'm a businessman. I want data before I make a decision. These boards are making decisions without the data for the best interest of whomever is making that decision for them. And that's the concern. Who put the agenda item on? How did they write it? It, a lot of times, is not the community. It's not the stakeholders. It's not the students, right? It's not even the teacher. There's other people that are tapping into that $40 million mm -hmm. that have found ways to extract it increase it on an ever-growing basis. And that's an issue. Anything else? No. Got anything? No, I don't have any right now. <laughs> the, uh, the thing that I was going to say, too, there's one other item, one that is this consolidation. Correct, sorry. Business, business in, the, uh, in, the, in the county. Uh, there's too much redundancy when it comes to certain things being done. Uh, for example, I'll give you this for an example. Just recently, the, the five districts all paid $6,500 to PSBA, Pennsylvania S uh, School Boards Association, to update their policies. Identically. We pay closer to $11,000. Well, this was just recently, though, now it's 6500 I believe we paid us to go up. Did you? But well, whatever it is, it's the same thing that they're doing for all the districts. You know. So that's well, in my opinion, redundant. I completely agree to a point where it's not for just cancel the arrangement. Oh. There's no reason that any district should give taxpayer money to a private corporation to write our policies when it's the responsibility of the board to do so. And then they use that money to silence the First Amendment rights of individuals and take them to court. And I can, yeah, and I agree. Doesn't make sense. I if you're going to become a slapper institution with taxpayer funds, governmental process, and that's that's where I, that's I don't believe that that should be. Funded. That's where I that's where I come from. If we have one board for the county, yeah. you know, one board for the county, it's one superintendent, one, one business manager, one HR department. Consolidation of purchasing and asset power, because mm -hmm. if we're all buying books and we're all buying desks and we're all buying pencils and we're all buying curriculum, it's it can be universally based. It's your school based. district, your school district only has certain number of credits to graduate. Do you know what it is? I don't. Okay. It's about twenty-three. So ours is twenty-eight. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So wait. Think that through for a second. Why can I go to your school and get to college faster, or get to the military, or get to my job, than just moving a, a mile down the street? And I'm stuck in school that's at a high school at a high school level. And that's not it's, it's not a reduction. It's a it's a state diploma. It says you need 21. Why are we adding a burden? onto an individual student of a high school level uh, um, class when they could be getting a college level class. 
they can be taken in household statistics. That's exactly what I have in mind also with consolidation. For Correct. example, right now if there's Shull David School in Lehigh, that should become the county schools. And we, what we wanted to have is this continuation of the educational process that by the time maybe after high school, but at least after two years of the community college, you have something in your mind that you can get a job with. You know, that's why I like the continuation in the L tri C, you know. If you consolidated the district, you'd have a significant savings and a betterment because of the curriculum for all the students. You'd be able to place those kids and they'd have the opportunity yeah. to make the motivation to say, I want to take that class. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And CCTI proves that because Correct. all the districts try to do it on their own years ago. They had their own shops, they had their own everything. Well, that might have been okay in that period, but today they have to have this extended training. CCTI does it, but it, we didn't make it big enough. And they're making a choice to go there, and therefore the, the matriculation rates, the success rates are higher because they have motivated students because they made the choice. I want to go to do this. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we're trying to involve. You've got to get the but right, motivation of the child. But, but right now, right now it's full up every year. 400 students, you know, you're, you're locked out of different things. And like Dave said here about taking other courses that don't really mean anything to you. Parents want to keep the kids in school though. I will say, if there is a, a family with two parents, you know, they want to... They, they, but, but they could be getting their college degree before they get to 12th grade. Absolutely. And, there's, and they don't have the equivalency. Go, correct. No, no, yeah, get, get, get their college degree mm -hmm. before they graduate from high school, before their 12th year of high school would have been. So if they'd be a sophomore and have a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. They'd apply to L Tri C, take full classes locally mm -hmm. at a college level, mm -hmm. meet the requirements, and have their two year degree while living at home. Getting the college experience, but not taking the college experience, if I can say so, right? Mm -hmm. Within a community where they don't have to pay for a room and board, which is an expensive part of college, mm -hmm. giving an opportunity to the community mm -hmm. with no additional cost. We, we absolutely need to consolidate and we have to start the, the dialogue. I completely agree. We have to start at least the dialogue because it's not an over the night, overnight thing to, to see how it, it, it uh, is completed with regard taxation or whatever is going on right now. Uh, I believe that's right within school code that you're allowed to consolidate districts within your, uh, your district. Two, two sets of boards can easily do it. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm what sorry. is the five credit difference between the two schools? Electives. What's, what it? Electives. Required electives though, correct? No. Not well, required, required electives. electives. No. Number of electives. And so the, the first requirement is state. You need a state right. diploma. You need, yeah. you need these 21 right. credits. In math, and science. And Heighton says, in addition to what the state tells you right. you need, I'm going to make you take these extra credits. So right. I want those butts in those seats mm -hmm. to take all these extra credits at a high school level. And I want to make that a college level to get your high school diploma. If a person is halfway through that process, they do not get a high school diploma, right. even though they meet the state that's standard. State. So that's a real disservice to the child. If he's got 24 credits in Lehigh and he doesn't get his diploma, but if he would have been in Jim Thorpe, he would have gotten his diploma because he missed these couple electives. Parents got sick, he had to move, he had to, and he has to go make it up somewhere else. He could have got his diploma if he meets the state standard. Mm -hmm. He can go to the military. There's kids that they show up at their senior year and they got like one class, you know, what are they going to do? <laughs> They're bored. Yes, and they're, and they're, and I'll use the the term that we always tease that the the students uh, brains turn to mush over the summer, Sunday. right? And it takes them a month to get started. Well, imagine a year of mush because you've already met all your requirements and you're restricted from advancing. Mm -hmm. Normally, you would need a, a, a IEP, <coughs> which is an individual educational program, to be able to meet some of these opportunities. I want to open that up to everybody. I want to be able, basically be able to say that everyone has the right to go take the entrance exam and then we'll, court, we'll find a way. Because where there's a will, there's a way. Let's go back to the Navy pilot. Right? It's not in the book. Let's go do it. 
let's go give these kids that opportunity to take those classes. And let's, if we have to, if we got enough of them, we, have, we graduate 200. If I got 50 kids that want to take a college level statistics class, let's bring the teacher up here. Mm -hmm. Why are we making kids drive down there? Mm -hmm. It's cheaper. Bring them up here. And see, that's we that, have the location for them. That's another thing with not only IEPs are for uh, students that need that have disabilities or need help. It's also a GIEP, which is a gifted. 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 Yes. Sir. You know, and we do it tremendous disjustice to those students because all we do is give them some enrichment. You throw right. them in with a teacher and give them a little enrichment. And then another thing we would motivation. do better, huh? They, they need to be have an opportunity for to fly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They need to be able to fly. And like AP courses, advanced placement courses, in the, all the five districts might only have four, five, six, seven students in each one. AP chemistry or AP physics, yeah. AP whatever. Uh, and it would be better if those students, just like they have buses going to like Mahoning School for it's an alternative school, behavior, uh, behavior health, yeah. behavior health. Yeah. And, and just so we want to take, that's why I say let's use Shoal David right now and get those gifted kids and the kids that are taking dual enrollment yeah. courses, you know, for at the college, get them over there. Or teach the same class at the AP level and then get two different tests. Test one, physical test two. This one meets the standard, you can try it, but if you don't answer those questions and you meet this standard, at least you pass the class. And that's the goal, right? You want to get graduate high school. But if you can meet this standard, taught by this teacher, you then have this pedigree, which now can move to Bloomsburg or Kutztown or, or Penn State or wherever else, because it meets the requirement. And that's what you're looking for. For this, would this be a reduction in teachers if you lower? No, it's a, oh, it's a transition of teachers. The teacher's not going to be teaching remedial uh, uh, high school level training. Mm -hmm. They're going to be moved up to advanced placement right. training, and they're going to get credits for it. No reason not to raise the bar. I'll give you an example, Byron. Uh, the middle school, the former high school in Lee Heighton there, that was designed for 1,000 students. I think they only have like 600 students in that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, we, didn't have, we didn't have a capacity problem. We had a management problem. You know, we had a leadership problem, a management problem, and a financial understanding of how debt works. And I we know, went from zero debt to 100 million in debt. I know for sure, now that it's existing, I know for sure they should let P Panther Valley's middle school come down there with them. Ship them right into Lee. Yeah. Definitely, well, wants to put another $11 million on the books. Hey, we can take their high school students in Jim Thorpe. Half go to the Votech, half go to Jim Thorpe's. But we're all part of the same program. So all the state taxpayers, every individual citizen within the state is paying that bill. Yes, bad. Jerry, it's unfortunate, and Dave, it's unfortunate we don't have reps from the PV school, school board here right yes. now. But everyone I've spoken to in that school district, and that would be the, from the CART from Carbon County, so it's not inclusive of Coldale. So Nesquamine, Summit Hill, uh, Lansford, uh, talks about the duress uh, that that system is under. You know, they'll make predictions. They'll say, well, we'll probably last three to five years. Who knows how long? PV could last forever. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, there is a sense, the word on the street, the scuttlebutt is that it won't last. Uh, they will not be able to support the education of the kids from those actual four communities there. So what contingency planning is taking place between, let's say, PV, Jim Thorpe, Tamaqua, so there is a contingency plan in place to incorporate those children in an orderly manner. So five years from now, we don't see 400 kids moving into Jim Thorpe and sticking them in trailers and the class ratio so goes the, from 1 to 25 to 1 to 34 or are those discussions taking place? Nothing, nothing's nothing, taking place. Nothing's taking place. But let me well, tell you, let me have, the answer. Well, we have a, you know, you hope for the best but plan for the worst is a thing we'd like to adopt. Do you think so that the, the, the state's going to just keep pumping the money in? Yeah. Now, the, the sad part is dogma is going to take over. However, yeah. Kennedy, right? Any one person can make a difference. Mm -hmm. Everyone should try. Mm -hmm. If we get a grassroots understanding that the Panther Valley School District, in the event, in the unlikely event that right. something happens, yeah. should be given the opportunity 
to implement school choice. Yeah. That whatever districts are closest to, whatever districts they find beneficial, whatever yeah. they have an affinity towards, give them their dollars and their resources and let them go spend it. Yeah. yeah. And now you can allow the individual districts to manage those dollars. Yeah. Because if we're full, your dollar might change, change. Because to have an extra classroom for one more person is going to cost more. Right. At which point the market forces will prevail. Prevail. And the government will get out of the way of deciding for you what your freedoms are going to be. Yeah. I wish that Heffley would be here at these, <laughs> at these kinds of uh, discussions. Symposiums? Yeah. We have in, in, uh, in the, among the five school districts, every year we have a legislative meeting with Heffley. Mm -hmm. Once a year only. So I'm always after him to come to the vote tech. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what? You lost, uh, you lost cameras. Uh, come to Are you the still tech and, and uh, no, you're still going. discuss how he perceives so this transition from because he's he's in favor of getting rid of the property tax. How does he perceive getting rid of that and make it easier to, to go in that direction? Right. And the and the answer really is first of all we gotta do some consolidation and I, I say that you should be the guy pushing it. And he tells me, no, you, you people should be the ones pushing that. Don't just...